Hello and welcome to our Year Ender Show. It's been a challenging year for Africa, but one that has had many bright spots too. We have a lot lined up for you from our correspondents who are standing by from various cities in Africa. In Egypt, Cairo, we have Adel Mahoui. And in Zimbabwe, Harare, we have Farai Mwakutuya. We'll also have guest analysis to dissect some of the top stories that shaped 2022. Well, as we mentioned, 2022 started with the Russia-Ukraine conflict, which impacted Africa in a number of ways. Food prices increased, jeopardizing food security. On the diplomacy front, Africa found itself under pressure to pick sides in the conflict. However, many countries chose to take a non-aligned position, an indication perhaps that the continent has come of age and is able to decipher how its interests are best protected CGTN's, CGTN's Wilke Sanyawa tells us more. Russia and Ukraine are substantial players in the global commodities market and the significant agricultural trade between African countries and Russia and Ukraine. The International Grains Council estimates that together they supply about 14% of the world's wheat supplies and there is significant agricultural trade between African countries and Russia and Ukraine. TradeMap, the World Trade Organization's international trade database, estimated that in 2020, Russia exported $12.4 billion worth of goods to Africa. So when it came to diplomatic responses to the conflict, each of the 54 African countries responded in different ways. You, you have to re recognize that each state is governed in different ways and has different international relations and different domestic needs that are served by those international and foreign policy re relations. While voting on the Russia-Ukraine conflict at the United Nations in March, 28 African countries supported a UN resolution condemning Russia's operation. On the other hand, Algeria, Tanzania and South Africa emphasized the importance of diplomacy but did not condemn Russia's actions. A total of 17 African countries simply chose to abstain from the vote. I think you have to break down and look at individual African countries and why they took the position that they did. And it's probably related to security relations with, with, with Russia. It could relate to financial relations with Russia. It could relate to a variety of things. AU chair and Senegalese president Marquis Sal visited Russia in July on a trip he said was aimed at minimizing the conflict's impact on Africa's supply of agricultural products and fertilizers. The continent has consistently sent signals that it is choosing non-alignment. As the Russia-Ukraine conflict continues, it is also disrupting agricultural and food supplies while threatening trade and economic growth on the African continent, influencing how Africa responds. Well, a few months into the Russia-Ukraine conflict, global oil and gas prices doubled and the cost of living in Africa skyrocketed. Inflation rates reached double digits in many countries across the continent. Food security worsened. Many countries rely on Russia and Ukraine for a significant percentage of their wheat, fertilizer or vegetable oil imports. But the conflict disrupted global commodity markets and trade flows to Africa, increasing already high food prices in the region. Well, for more on this, let's bring in Adel Mahui, who is at Egypt, Cairo, and Farai Makutia, who joins us from Harare. Well, let's just start with that point of the effect in the Russia-Ukraine conflict on Egypt's food crisis, which is described as an existential threat to the economy. Adel, can you tell us more about how the conflict impacted Egypt and neighboring countries there? Well, Egypt, in terms of direct impact when it comes to food security from the Russian-Ukrainian crisis, the country says that it has been affected uh, with an estimated 1.5 billion US dollars in the food sector alone. That comes in direct and indirect impact on its food because Egypt relies heavily on Russia and Ukraine for its basic foods. We're talking about 70 to 85 percent from essential goods like wheat and vegetable oil come from these two countries. And therefore, with the crisis emerging 
food prices was quite a challenge and to allocate other resources was a huge challenge for Egypt. And that has pushed the country for two tracks. The first is to diversify its uh, food imports that it desperately needs so that it wouldn't rely heavily on one or two countries as we've seen in the Russian-Ukrainian crisis, but also to expand its agricultural land productivity and cultivation. But this is a long-term plan that Egypt has been on uh, this track for about uh, three to four years but of course it takes a lot of time to expand the cultivation and yield better um, agricultural uh, product but at the same time the country is moving to enhance its agricultural techniques in the already cultivated land so that it can improve the productivity uh, per acre across the country and that helps by using um, um, advanced irrigation techniques as well as modern, uh, modern agricultural techniques to maintain that the current land can produce its maximum while the country moves to expand the area of cultivated land. Let's head over to Zimbabwe's capital, Harare. Harare, even before the conflict between Russia and Ukraine broke out, Zimbabwe's economy was already saddled with rising inflation, low foreign direct, among other challenges. Paint us a picture of the situation in Zimbabwe. Well, indeed, Hana, inflation continues to be a thorn in the side of the flesh of ordinary citizens as well as authorities here. Latest statistics show that monthly inflation has come down to has gone up slightly to about two and a half percent. Annual inflation has come down from 255 percent to about 243 percent, but still one of the highest rates in the world. And that has a direct impact on how people have spent their money, have gone about, uh, you know, spending their money. Incomes have been eroded and money isn't going as far as it used to. And that's been felt by many ordinary citizens here. The saving grace of what has come to the rescue of many is the fact that diaspora remittances have risen quite substantially. And so that is what's driving a lot of the domestic demand that we're seeing, a lot of domestic expenditure, particularly in terms of uh, creating retail demand, as well as in the construction sector, where a lot of people continue to build their own homes. That's been driven largely, indeed, by that, um, you know, diaspora investments that are coming through. But directly on the issue of food security, governments did step up and aggressively went out to try and increase the wheat production in the country. It's invited private sector players to engage in joint ventures, to finance uh, crop production to expand the land on which uh, wheat has been grown in this country. And what that has led to is the biggest wheat harvest Zimbabwe has seen since the 1960s. Uh, and many here believe that this could lay the foundations for the country to eventually become self-sustaining in terms of wheat production, also grain production. We know that uh, government uh, uh, you know, financing will continue to ensure that there is food security in that regard. Uh, but I think the biggest problem is indeed the fact that inflation continues to weigh down people. They don't have much money to spend. And uh, the expectation is that hopefully things will get better in the new year. But you know, that is the reality for many Zimbabweans right now very difficult times well thank you so much for that farai farai mokutuya speaking to us from harare zimbabwe and adil mahui was speaking to us from cairo in egypt well the horn of africa as with other parts of the continent was significantly impacted by the russia ukraine conflict but for the horn the food crisis was made even worse by the impact of climate change let's link up with cgtn's raman young for more on africa's climate situation in 2022 Thank you, Hannah. Now, for many, 2022 was supposed to be the year of climate action. After all, we're coming into this year with many pledges having been made by world leaders the year before in Glasgow during COP26. But as 2022 comes to a close, it wraps up as a year that sets a very grim new record on climate change, somewhat a scale that even climate scientists had not forecast. African countries were being battered by more record-breaking floods and droughts that caused widespread destruction. Let's dig a little deeper into the drastic effects of climate change across the continent, starting perhaps with a headline number that you might have been hearing about all year round. 2022 was the fourth consecutive below par rain season in the Horn of Africa, and that left it in its worst drought in four decades. At least 36 million people are suffering from this prolonged drought with over 9 million livestock dead across Ethiopia, Kenya and Somalia. And drought, remember, isn't just a food and water problem. This sort of crisis tends to snowball very quickly into other areas. By November, the FAO was pointing out that the number of persons without access to safe drinking water 
That had risen to at least 16.2 million, with households struggling to cope with outbreaks of diarrhea and cholera. But this, remember, is just the Horn of Africa. That's one corner of a bigger continent that's home to 1.2 billion people. Across the continent as a whole, 12% of people in sub-Saharan Africa are facing acute food insecurity as we speak. Climate-linked shocks are also present in Madagascar, Angola, even Nigeria, which had its worst flooding in a decade. Those floods have displaced 3.2 million people while submerging at least 676,000 hectares of farmland. That's like flooding an area the size of Luxembourg twice over. Before the flooding, nearly 19.5 million Nigerians were food insecure, and that number, as we speak, has likely risen. So clearly, the problem is a critical one, but what can be done? Remember, many countries across the continent are net food importers. Nigeria and Egypt between them, for example, they're among the world's biggest importers of rice and wheat. And what most governments have tried to do is to lower the cost of food or food-related inputs like fuel and fertilizer. Nigeria, for example, has kept its largely inefficient fuel subsidies still in place. So has Kenya in the east. Malawi, Niger, Senegal and Zimbabwe, they've all cut taxes on food or fuel. Others, like Cote d'Ivoire and Benin, have introduced price controls as a coping mechanism. But unfortunately, these solutions like food and fuel subsidies, they have limited reach and governments don't have the fiscal room or the money to keep these programs going indefinitely. So with a view to longer term solutions in a hotter, more hostile climate, governments have opted for a different set of solutions. Kenya, for example, ended a decade long ban on the import, consumption and cultivation of genetically modified crops in October, ostensibly as a hedge against more frequent droughts and rising temperatures. In Nigeria, which has an annual food import bill of around $20 billion, the central bank has been working on trying to raise the amount of affordable credit that farmers and agro-processors can get. There is a bit of good news, however. Despite all the crises that we just mentioned, in a country like Zimbabwe, the country has had its biggest ever wheat harvest since commercial cultivation started there in 1966. After Glasgow, 2022 was the year that COP27 came to Egypt. And it was, of course, convened against a backdrop of multiple crises around the world, including a global pandemic and the ongoing conflict that we're still seeing in Ukraine. African countries had hoped that this summit would draw attention to the severe impact that climate change is having across the continent. And in some ways, it did. After two weeks of negotiations, which went all the way past the appointed last hour, COP27 delivered new funding arrangements and an agreement to figure out how developed economies should compensate developing ones for the damage caused by the greenhouse gas emissions before COP28 in the United Arab Emirates. Adel Mahrouki has that report. Emerging economies speed their own the first calls to pay for loss and damage first emerged in 1991 by the Alliance of Small Island States, the most vulnerable countries to the rise in sea levels. Yet the issue was not tackled seriously before 2013. That's why it was widely celebrated when Egypt led the efforts to officially include the topic on COP27's agenda, which established a historic loss and damage fund. The whole uh, notion of loss and damage has not been discussed. Now it's been discussed at COP27 and they have agreed uh, to establish this uh, fund for compensation. So we're moving more towards achieving climate justice uh, normally, when we try to speak about damage and loss as well as impacted country, we need to identify who, uh, who was uh, responsible for such impact. And this is a, is a problem itself. It is a dilemma. We are requesting cooperation between developing and uh, developed uh, countries. Uh, developed countries are afraid from uh, litigation or other sort of compensation. They may be asked if they admit their responsibilities. But establishing the fund sparks many debates, the first of which is the definition of loss and damage and which countries would fall into the category that deserves financing. How extreme climate episodes, rise of sea level and biodiversity loss would rank the vulnerability of each country. A committee of 24 countries that will convene in 2023 will be discussing all these details. Experts, however, fear that the longer these negotiations take, the bigger the financial demands will grow. 
As presidents of COP27 and the upcoming COP28 in Dubai, Egypt and the UAE will be working closely to help in drafting a clearer role for the loss and damage fund. And then these discussions are scheduled during COP28 in November next year. Experts estimate that the fund could be activated by 2025. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. The United Nations has warned the effects of climate change are only going to get worse if no urgent, sustained action is taken. And the poorest countries around the world will continue to pay the heaviest price. To discuss this in a bit more detail, let's bring in Murari Aminu Kano, Director of Policy and Government Relations Covering Africa from the Nature Conservancy. He's joining me from the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Um, so this historic deal arrived at at COP27 overcompensation. It's the first time that loss and damages was actually a discussion item on the table. But how optimistic are you that rich countries will pay for this loss and damages, considering the fact that they did not deliver on prior pledges of providing at least $100 billion a year in adaptation funding? Yes, I think the deal in Sharm el-Sheikh at COP27 on loss and damage is quite historic. It's historic because for more than 30 years, developing countries have been asking for uh, a facility to recognize the losses and damages that they suffer due to the consequences of climate change. And climate change, as we know, is primarily caused by developed countries, the historic one we are facing. And they have been blocked from this facility being set up. So the setting up of the facility in Sharm el-Sheikh and the agreement to do that is quite historic. And you are right to be a bit skeptical about will the developed countries now fill the pot that has been established. Uh, but I am cautiously optimistic uh, because, like I said, for a long time there wasn't even an agreement to set up the facility. But most importantly, I think the developed countries have now realized the trust deficit between them and developing countries for reneging and refusing to fulfill their commitment on financing for so long. Murari Aminu Kano from the Nature Conservancy there. Thank you. Now that, of course, is a brief snapshot of how the climate crisis has affected food and policy across Africa. As 2022 comes to a close, weather experts are already suggesting that 2023 might be even hotter. And that partly explains why the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, is expected to issue a call for a no-nonsense climate summit in 2023 to spur concrete action and a lot less talk. That's it for me. Back to Hannah for the security issue that shaped 2022. Well, thank you so much for all that, Rama. Well, welcome to our segment on security. Incidents of insecurity continued across a number of African countries in 2022. Most of these were brought on by coups, violent extremism, as well as terror attacks. These events disrupted people's lives, stalling economic development as well. Few corners of the continent were left unscathed, from Mali to Sudan, Guinea to Somalia, Burkina Faso to South Africa. Well, let's take a key look at some of the highlights of 2022 as far as political happenings on the continent are concerned. Burkina Faso's military overthrew the government of President Roch Mark Christian Kabore in January. Eight months later, the new military leader, President Paul Henri Dambiva, was deposed in yet another coup. The September coup was the second in a year. In February, armed assailants attempted to carry out a coup to unseat the government of Guinea Bissau. The country's president, Omaro Sissoko Mbalo, said at least 11 people were killed in the attempt. In October, security forces in Chad reportedly opened fire on protesters in several cities across the country, including N'Djamena, the capital, killing at least 50 people and injuring dozens more. The protesters had taken to the streets to demand that the ruling military junta stick to its promises to hold elections. In Sudan, protests against military rule continued throughout the year. Sudan's military and civilian leaders in December signed an initial deal aimed at ending the crisis that followed a coup a year ago. And over in Sierra Leone, dozens of protesters and police officers were killed in August as people vented their anger over the soaring cost of living. 
The West African political and economic bloc ECOWAS condemned the violence. But let's take a more in-depth look at some of the incidents that shaped 2022. We begin in Nigeria, where the country is just weeks away from a presidential election. Insecurity threatens to undermine the vote as violence carried out by militants and criminal gangs has continued to plague that country. This despite government assurances that it's winning the war against criminals. Our correspondent, Sema Kende, reports. Nigeria's president, Muhammad Buhari, has pledged that the country will be safe and secure by the end of his tenure next year. Many hope that will be the case, but they are worried. That's because thousands of people were killed in the first six months of this year alone, while over 3,000 were kidnapped by suspected terrorists. January saw one of the deadliest attacks in the country's history. Over 200 people were killed in the northwestern state of Zamfara, leaving over 10,000 displaced. Many say the situation has become worse since then. A farmer cannot freely go to the farm email alone, just like the way it was before that you can just go farm you alone and come back without anybody you know, disturbing you or anything. I have the cases of people going to farm and they will not return. I know the government are trying their best to copy it off, but it's still an organized crime to me. From a scale of one to 10, I would say um, we'll score them two or three there about because there has been a lot of loopholes. In February, 1,214 persons were killed by gunmen across the country. In March, suspected Boko Haram terrorists attacked an Abuja-bound passenger train, killing 14 people and abducting 63 others. In June, suspected members of the Islamic State's West Africa province, a splinter faction of the Boko Haram terror group, attacked a Catholic church in Ondo State, southwest of the country, and killed about 50 people. Security analysts say the illegal possession of firearms has largely fueled the violence. The viability, commercial viability of that criminal act is what is driving, driving them. Now, as one reason. The other reason is ideology. What you require is ammunition. So you find out that it's a big business. Big business. And then once you hold the gun as ignorant as an ignorant and illiterate individual, you have so much power. According to the Cable Index, gunmen killed 115 people in Nigeria in August this year, among them 89 civilians and eight police officers. 131 persons were kidnapped across the six geopolitical zones of the country in the same month. In October, local media reported that at least 19 suspected militants affiliated with the Islamic State West Africa province were killed by security forces in Borno State, the epicenter of an insurgency in the country. Experts want the government to disarm civilians and recruit more security personnel to deal with the crisis. According to Nigeria's security advisor, over 50 acts of political violence have been witnessed in 22 of the country's 36 states in the last three months. This has led to fears that insecurity could affect the 2023 elections. But the government insists it's doing all it can to keep Nigerians safe. President Muhammad Buhari has directed security agencies to ensure stability before December 31st. Several campaigns towards a violence-free election are also ongoing, and security agencies have promised to ensure peaceful polls in February next year. Military commanders say they are also expecting more ammunition procured by the government for the armed forces, raising hopes that the widespread insecurity will end soon. Tassim Akendi, CGTN Jaws. Well, we'll stay with that story. Let's now bring in Achike Trude, an African affairs analyst in Lagos, for a more detailed look at the security situation, not just in Nigeria, but the greater Sahel region. Achike, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a politically charged year for the West African region, from political instability to security challenges. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Hannah. Um, it's it's been a, one would say um, it's it's been a very tough uh, period for West Africa. I mean, all manners of uh, challenges um, confronting uh, the people and governments of uh, West Africa. 
uh, obviously, uh, you know, you talked about um, uh, your earlier reports, you talked about uh, the, you know, climate situation that led to flooding, you know, in many parts of uh, the West African, you know, uh, sub-region, uh, Nigeria, you know, Sierra Leone, Ghana, and other parts of the country. And then you are having a very serious economic uh, challenges. Of course, don't forget that uh, we are just uh, coming out of uh, the COVID, uh, massive COVID uh, restrictions that also imposed a lot of uh, you know, the stabilizing situation on West African countries affected the economies badly, uh, you know. And then, of course, the Ukraine war uh, with uh, the uh, ban and uh, with the uh, difficulty in uh, bringing essential uh, food uh, stuff like wheat and the rest also affected the continent. But beyond that, you know, is uh, the one that uh, concerns, um, you know, life essentially and their property, and that is uh, insecurity, which has been on the rise, you know, in. Uh, uh, the sub, you know, in the sub region, and of course, uh, you're also talking about even the spread, because it's not just that uh, the insecurity issues are just limited to places where they have uh, been occurring for quite some time, but you also have, you know, in uh, very, for the very first time, you begin to have attacks in places like Togo and then uh, Bene Republic also. So that gives you an idea that uh, it is spreading in a very worrying, uh, you know, rate. Uh, and so, ob obviously, uh, the governments of uh, West Africa have been much, much concerned. If you remember, uh, just recently, about a few weeks ago, they talked about uh, setting up, um, you know, a stabilization force. And this is the very first time that they will be talking about that. Yes, they've had some, uh, you know, similar, you know, certain other operations, uh, really, like in Guinea-Bissau, where they have had to, you know, send, uh, you know, uh, troops to stabilize uh, that uh, country. But we've not had it, you know, in a standing capacity. And so I think that is, they are worried about uh, the, you know, increasing uh, state of uh, insecurity. That is what has brought that about. Not just, uh, you know, the attempt to tackle insurgency and insecurity and kidnapping uh, that uh, is happening all over, you know, many parts of uh, the, the, the subcontinent, uh, uh, but also the issue of uh, the coups that have also co brought, you know, with them uh, political instability in the subregion. So uh, you, we are going to expect in the next uh, few uh, uh, months, perhaps much more active participation by West African uh, forces acting together jointly to tackle some of uh, these uh, insecurity issues. Thank you so much for all that, Achike. That was Achike Chudo, an African affairs analyst who is joining us from Lagos for a detailed look at the security situation in West Africa. So this is it. I'm just about to be shot. Tense here. Bottles are being thrown as they do so. Uh, we there are about three critical <laughs> bridges <laughs> here in Malawi. That's one of them. We're going to cross that bridge. As you can see behind me, police forces who are replying with gas. Yeah, gas just That's came in. gas. So it's all begun now. Divisions leading the charge into West Mosul have brought us here. Just got to be careful here with some gunshots. Excuse. This is where most of the fighting has been concentrated. This is the front line now after nine days of fighting. We're about two to three kilometers from Within the front line. Within clear view of this front line position. Well, let's now shift attention to the Horn of Africa and specifically Ethiopia. For two years, Ethiopia has seen a conflict that has claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands and displaced millions more. However, just as the year was coming to an end, the Ethiopian government and the TPLF signed a peace agreement. One month on, the guns have fallen silent and there's been a resumption of basic services like water and electricity in parts of the Tigray region. Humanitarian assistance is also being delivered in the Tigray, Amhara and Afar regions. Even so, many are still concerned about long-lasting peace. Here's CNCN's Girum Chala with that report. On November 4, 2020, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed authorized a military operation against TPLF after an attack on a federal military base outside of Tigray's capital, Mekele. <laughs> Government troops from Addis Ababa would be sent, as well as fighters from the nearby Amhara area and Eritrean force involved, the war would drag on for another two years. With communication cut off, it's been difficult to know the exact number of casualties. Thousands, though, are believed to have been killed, millions displaced. A prolonged drought in the Horn of Africa country has made things worse. In early November, 
the two warring sides met in South Africa for talks mediated by the African Union and signed a peace deal. Any given country cannot survive without peace. War can only destroy human lives and result also in the degradation of the economy. Therefore, the peace accord between the government and TPLF was really highly instrumental. This is something that has created a sense of joy for all and brought a huge hope too. The African Union described it as a new dawn. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed called it monumental. While this would not be the first deal since the war began, it was different. Other than the cessation of hostilities, the TPLF would be disarmed and integrated in the National Army. There would be a resumption of basic services like water and electricity and aid deliveries to the millions of people in need. The only way our problems can be solved is when the problems of Ethiopia are solved. Any individualized approach centering only on one's region, city or locality will not work. I assure you, no individual problem will be solved before the national challenges we are faced with. The African Union which brokered the peace deal is happy with the progress made in Tigray so far. The end of hostilities, better aid delivery and regular communication between the warring sides. Still, despite the optimism, many are still worried. I believe we have to leave what must be left for concerned bodies and focus on the peace gained. I see lots of people meddling in several political agendas of the country, which by the way is creating lots of balance in the country. Media must also be well governed, though freedom of speech is what I support. Despite the guns falling silent and life slowly returning to Tigray, authorities are cautious and have been urging members of the public to support the peace process. There are still many who are working day and night to destroy Ethiopia. They are giving us new agenda items for us not to enjoy the peace achieved at least for a month. I ask all of you not to give ears to those people. I appeal to all of you to work with the Ethiopian government with unity, solidarity and the rule of law. I ask you to okay your respective roles in sustaining our peace. Both the Ethiopian government and the TPLF have committed to implement the peace deal and so far it appears to be holding. A high-level AU panel would monitor and supervise its implementation. Experts, however, see it as a win for the continent, describing it as an African solution to an African problem. Grumdala CGT and Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. The United Nations has long enjoyed legitimacy as the international arbiter on issues of war and peace. However, in recent months, the UN peacekeeping missions in Africa have been facing serious questions around their legitimacy over failure to security to bring security on the continent. The UN mission in the DRC, known as MINUSCO, and the one in Mali, known as MINMUSA, are some of the missions currently in trouble with both governments and local host communities. CGTN's Daniel Arab Moy tells us more. 2022 saw two major United Nations peacekeeping missions in Africa encounter violent protest against their presence. The United Nations Stabilization Mission in the Democratic Republic of Congo and the Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission in Mali have faced strong criticism by host communities. In the DRC, for example, the protests were spurred by complaints that MONUSCO failed to protect the population from attacks by armed militants. And so there's public pressure and political pressure on these UN peacekeeping missions to go and fight the bad guys, to take the fight to the bad guys. And that's what these UN missions can't do. It's what they've never been set up to do. They're not willing to do it. In Mali, MINUSMA was accused of doing little to protect people from attacks by insurgents. The UN mission in the DRC comprises over 18,000 personnel and it's the largest in the world. The mission has been authorized to use all necessary means to carry out its mandate in protecting civilians under imminent threat. 
The United Nations Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission in Mali comprises over 17,000 personnel. The missions are meant to support the host nation's efforts to achieve stability and peace. But the two missions have both received varied and at times limited acknowledgement and cooperation from the host governments and communities. The future is going to be more and more messy and it's going to be more and more fragmented. I think UN peacekeeping is not going to go away straight away. Not least because it brings in a lot of money because it's funded by, of course, by uh, major UN powers. Protesters in the DRC and Mali have been calling for the exit of the UN missions from their respective countries. Analysts say there is need for a wider consent from governments and communities if UN peacekeepers are to effectively execute their mandate. Daniel Arapmoy, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Well, 2022 has not entirely been a year riddled with political instability for the continent. There have also been a few bright spots. A number of African countries went to the polls this year, and despite some disputes, were able to navigate the process successfully. CGTN's Wilka Sanyawa is back with more insights. In August 2022, Angola went to the polls in an election that some analysts called the most hotly contested election in the country's history. The ruling MPLA got 51.17% of the votes cast, compared with 43.95% for the leading opposition party, the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola, UNITA. UNITA leader Alberto da Costa Jr. initially rejected the results, however the Electoral Commission upheld those results. This gave the MPLA party's candidate, Jao Lorenzo, a second term as president. As Africa's largest crude oil producer, Angola is considered an important partner in the region, but wealth distribution is seen as largely unbalanced. On 9th of August, Kenya also went to the polls. The hotly contested election pitted former Prime Minister and five-time presidential candidate Raila Odinga against former Deputy President William Ruto. The Electoral Commission declared Ruto the winner, but his opponent, Odinga, challenged that result at the country's Supreme Court. The court's decision upholding the election paved the way for Ruto's swearing in. And although Odinga's party has continued to speak out about alleged irregularities in these polls, the country experienced a smooth transition to a new government. Further down south, in Lesotho, a new party led by political rookie and diamond magnate Sam Matekane won 56 out of 120 seats in parliament. The Revolution for Prosperity Party, however, fell short of securing a parliamentary majority and needs to woo other groups to control parliament. Lesotho has been plagued by years of political instability under previous regimes and is hoping to change its course with a new government. Somalia held its presidential election in May in an airport hangar protected from insurgents. Members of parliament voted in Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, a 66-year-old who ruled the country from 2012 to 2017. He faces the daunting task of rebuilding a nation of 15 million people, which is suffering its worst drought in four decades and has endured conflict since 1991. However, some citizens see the fact that yet another election was successfully held and led to a peaceful transfer of power as a promising sign. Countries such as Sudan and those in the Sahel region postponed their elections due to various political developments. In 2023, 26 African countries are scheduled to hold elections for various positions. They too will be hoping to carry out peaceful processes that could change the course of their countries. Well, it's time now for us to take a short break. When we return... The Democratic Republic of Congo finally buries independence hero Lumumba 60 years after his assassination.
Welcome back. Well, 2022 was also the year when Africa's nationalist giant, Patrice Lumumba, was finally laid to rest 60 years after he was assassinated. This was after Belgian authorities returned a tooth of the independence hero to his children and a move towards recognition of atrocities that accompanied the country's brutal exploitation of its former colony. The relic is all that remains of Lumumba, the first prime minister of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. CDTN's Kristo Chamringa has more from Kinshasa. The relic of Congolese independence leader Patrice Emery Lumumba was returned to the DRC in June. Lumumba was the DRC's first prime minister after the country gained independence from Belgium in 1960. He was killed by a firing squad in 1961 for his anti-colonial stance. His body was later dissolved in acid. A tooth is all that remained of him. No say. It is a very important step for us to put an end to the painful colonial history with this burial. This is not just a relic, it is his body. In our African culture, when somebody dies in a faraway place, his remains are considered to be his body, be it his hair or fingernails. Now his soul can rest in peace. His remains were laid to rest in this mausoleum on June 30th as the DRC celebrated its 62nd independence anniversary. Lumumba is back and his soul is in peace now and there's going to be no trouble. I'm telling you, this is a revelation I'm giving to you that as the relic of Lumumba is back here, you will see there's going to be no trouble. But an armed conflict has been raging in eastern DRC. The return of Lumumba's remains has been described as the start of reconciliation between the DRC and Belgium. Belgium's King Philip visited the DRC in June this year and expressed his deepest regrets for his country's colonial abuses. The visit of the Belgian king was insignificant. Members of my political party went to welcome him, but I chose to stay away. I kept meditating on the atrocities the Belgians committed here and felt the king should have issued an apology before he came. But not everyone was disappointed. The king's visit was very important. We were happy with what he said, but now we want to see action, an improvement in our relations. Belgium colonized the Congo in 1885. Historians estimate that up to 10 million Congolese were killed during the reign of King Leopold II. The assassination of Patrice Lumumba in 1961 was a brutal act that sparked an uproar across the DRC and some African countries. The return and burial of his relic back home brought joy to many people who consider him a matter to colonialism, Western capitalism and greed. Chris Sochamringa, CGTN. Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. Well, for more on that historic development, let's bring in Joseph Ocheno, an African affairs commentator. He joins us via Zoom from Tororo in Uganda. Thank you so much for joining us, Joseph. There was mixed reactions over the return of Patrice Lumumba's tooth for burial, with some seeing this as a chance for redemption by Belgium, while others accuse Brussels of exploiting opportunity without making a solid commitment to rectify its, its historical wrongs. What's your take on this, Joseph? I think it's a, a very significant uh, move, considering the fact that um, Africans in Congo and indeed across the continent have uh, over the years uh, fought and campaigned uh, to raise this matter, uh, both at a continental level and indeed globally. And in fact, it is interesting, isn't it, that um, uh, the Belgians themselves at some stage tended to want to take a defensive approach, as if uh, talking about Patrice Lumumba at some time, sometimes was possibly a matter of crime. That said, really, um, Patrice Lumumba, um, a very short-lived uh, African prime minister of the richest country on the continent, um, happens to be possibly the most popular African leader died partly because of his assass assassination, but partly because of the convictions uh, that he did have. You can imagine that this man was killed, democratically elected, he hadn't served months really as the leader, and the reason was primarily because of the resources in Congo. 
Number two, primarily because of the ideological commitment. So Patrice Lumumba, poor guy, simply happened to be leftist, progressive left. Uh, Cold War meant he was much more leaning towards Soviet Union and perhaps a China rather than Anglo America. And for that, really, the Belgians and in, in suggest CIA and other agencies got involved and made sure that they used their usual proxies that they still continue to use today to make sure that they killed this man. That said, today, ironically, the country has never settled, in part because of that. From a conciliatory point of view, we can hope that uh, this can begin to have a genuine conversation inside Congo, a genuine conversation around the region. Perhaps Pan-Africanists, both on the continent and around the world, can begin to review some of our very terrible historical pasts and then begin to work with the rest of the world and to demand, if you like, that Africa at last from about now can be treated fairly as, if you like, natural, neutral, level, level um, if you like, balanced partners and players in the, in the world. Thank you so much for all that. Joseph Ocheno speaking to us there from Uganda. Well, meanwhile, Nigeria's entertainment sector is increasingly being recognized across the globe because of its productions. More people around the world are sampling Nigerian music and movies. One of the West African nation's most embraced genres is its Afrobeat music, which is slowly making its way up global music charts. CDTN's Kelechi Emekalam tells us more. It's rehearsal time for the Shine Band, an award-winning performing musical group based in Abuja, Nigeria's capital. The 10-member crew has been thrilling its growing audience with a variety of musical genres. But the Shine Band is largely famous for its Afrobeat grooves. There were times in Nigeria where we don't, we, you, you don't go to parties and, or, and hear Nigerian songs. It's, the case is different today. You hear Nigerian songs first. Afrobeat is winning right now. We're winning. And I don't want to also say that it's, it's a season for Afrobeat because it's always going to be big. The attention is always going to be here. Afrobeat originated in Nigeria in the 1960s. It was the brainchild of late music legend Fela Kuti. The genre is a fusion of Nigerian traditional rhythms and Western sounds. Afrobeat artists are well sought after around the world, selling out at concerts, bagging awards, collaborating with A-list international artists and making good money. Entertainment makers, um, the artists that come in here, like out of 10 artists, nine of them, in, in fact, all of them want to do the Afro thing. You know, whether, it's, whether you're doing um, hip hop, there's that element of Afro that you must want to bring into it. You go to party now, <laughs> if you don't play Afro beat, I mean, you've not started. Over 100 plaques has come to Niger from the global scene. On a boy earning up to $500,000, you know, for, for performance, for one performance, that's half a million dollars. We skid getting, like I said before, up to a million dollars for a show, you know. Music makers say Afrobeat's dominance is due to its rare and unique vibes. Despite the growth of its popularity, artists still struggle with getting funds to produce quality works. Musicians and music lovers are optimistic that the rich culture of Africa will keep Afrobeat relevant for many years to come. Kilichia Mekalam, CGT and Abuja, Nigeria. Well, this year, various countries intensified diplomatic efforts in Africa. Relations between China and Africa continued to grow from strength to strength in 2022. The two collaborated in various sectors, partnering to fight COVID-19, address food security challenges, and generate economic development and empowerment. TGTN's Robert Nagila looks at how this partnership is evolving. As 2022 drew to a close, one of the biggest events in China's political calendar, the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China, was held, drawing a blueprint for China's future development. For Africa, the CPC set the stage for renewed cooperation with China. The two major concepts, new concepts, that President Xi Jinping and China Communist Party has brought up, which is the Global Development Initiative and Global Security Initiative. Uh, these concepts 
are within um, the narrative of global south and particularly within the United Nations, where core issues of security and development are central to Africa's stability, uh, development, and relation with the international community, particularly China. The year began with China's foreign minister Wang Yi's Africa tour, a three-decade-old tradition that sees Chinese foreign ministers visit Africa as their first overseas trip of the year. The foreign minister toured Eritrea, Kenya and the Comoros. When the pandemic was at its peak, China's donation of vaccines, medical equipment and expertise proved vital in controlling the spread of COVID-19 across the continent. And following a promise made by Chinese President Xi Jinping during the 2021 Forum on China-Africa Cooperation held in Dakar, Senegal, China cancelled interest-free loans to 17 African countries. Despite the pandemic, trade between Africa and its largest trading partner hit new highs. In 2021, two-way trade between China and Africa stood at $254 billion. That's an increase of $67 billion from the previous year, which stood at $187 billion, despite the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on global trade. China has also opened um, more opportunities for African countries, particularly in the agriculture sector. Um, uh, more African products entering African uh, Chinese markets and and Chinese markets, um, um, products entering African markets. And I think we're going to see more tangible um, trade uh, between Africa and China. And the ongoing infrastructure uh, development is a key area. Through FORCAC, a platform for economic cooperation and investment, and the Belt and Road Initiative, which aims to improve access and connectivity through infrastructure development, China's been instrumental in modernizing Africa's infrastructure by financing and constructing roads, ports and airports. Experts believe this collaboration between China and Africa will grow in 2023, expanding into new areas of cooperation with the aim of bringing about sustainable development through win-win cooperation. Robert Nagila, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Well, as we've seen, 2022 has been a buzz with activities and challenges on many fronts from Uganda, Ghana to Egypt. Here's some of the views of people recapping the year that has been their ex about their expectations in the coming year. Let's listen in. I see ourselves continuing to recover from the effects of COVID. I see ourselves continue to cope with the effects of Ukraine and Russia war, but uh, with the, the production of food, uh, increased effort and hard working over the body, we should be able to have a resilient economy. Most Ghanaians, we pretty much expect that next year will be another tough year because the budget has been read. We've heard a number of taxes being introduced, which would contribute to the increasing cost of goods and services. So um, we don't have too much excitement going into next year. I wish prices would go down so that people would live comfortably. Life is becoming hard on most people. We're a middle class family and we feel that pressure. I can't imagine what poorer people are going through. Well, that's it for this edition of our Africa Live Year Ender Show.